Well, we have a lot to cover today, so I will go ahead and start us on time. Thank you all for coming to the panel on digitally skilling our youth, very global approaches. Uh, my name is Christopher Yu. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where I lead an initiative called One World Connected, uh, where we are trying to study different ways to promote internet connectivity. Specifically, we have a booth immediately outside the door. If you are interested, we have a brochure on digital literacy projects on youth that identifies 25 projects globally that, uh, and if you're interested in learning from other projects and how they're doing, it's a useful resource. It is also uh, the, the basis of the remarks that one of our speakers, Sharda Srinivasan, will make towards the end uh, in the second half of this program. But I just wanted to th welcome you and thank you for coming and for sharing the interests uh, that we all have in, in providing, promoting, in learning how to promote the digital literacy of youth as that is critical for the future for all of us in the, in our interest in the internet. Um, I will introduce our uh, three, our four speakers uh, all at once now and you will hear them speak. Um, our first two speakers will be Lily Butche, uh, a Yali alumna and part of the Global Shapers Accra Hub she works with the Ghana Community Network Services Limited on the electric health management system as a system tester and was a 2018 youth at, internet, at the Internet Governance Forum here and uh, works, founded the Global Repository of Internet Studies birth from the forum. Uh, Gabriel Carzon identifies as a digital dreamer, a protagonist of the youth narrative in building our dream internet through equity and accessibility, internet for all. He has a background in computer science and uses his skill sets in breaking complexities of the technology world with a podcast called Dream Internet Voices and is a passionate volunteer at the Union of Tanzania Press Clubs as youth liaison. And Liz Orembo is a fellow at the Kenya ICT Action Network working on research and advocacy on internet freedoms including freedom of expression, information and privacy. They train journalists on digital security, and she's part of the ISOC Kenya chapter, the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance, and works on policy in Kenya. We are grateful to all of them for being here. We will have one remote participant. Sharda Srinivasan is a graduate of the National of um, uh, Bachelor's of Electrical Engineering from Ramaya Institute of Technology, a graduate of the National Law School of India University with a master's in public policy and has been a fellow at the One World Connected Project at the University of Pennsylvania for the last three years. So um, moving right into the program, I wanted to start off with uh, Lily and Karzan. Um, if you would help us set, uh, understand what it is that digital, digital skills training for youth really means. What do people, what do youth need? What are the kinds of things that you need to prepare you for the challenges that you see before you? And what are the barriers and what are the most effective ways you've seen to deliver these types of goals? So Lily, since you're sitting right next to me, you get to go first. Ah, that's fine, right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lily from Ghana, and I'll try as much to share from my part of the world what has worked and what um, digital skills and digital literacy means to us and ways that uh, organizations and, com and communities are actually taking um, steps to help youth or young people from my part of the world. And so digital skills now um, is of essence to everybody, especially the youth who are said to be the very first generation of active users of the internet, who will not only grow up using it, but also building the very core of the internet and more. And uh, we are in an era where everything is moving from manual to digital and in a, a revolution where um, it's called the fourth industrial revolution and many things are springing up and many emerging technologies talking about IoT and AI and more. So the youth understand that uh, to thrive in such a world we need some skills to play as digital citizens and uh, from coming from my background you you get to know that the very foundation that um, digitalization plays on, such as infrastructure and more, and to some extent are actually lacking. There is, there is access, now we talk about affordability on the other side. But what uh, has been very popular of late is the use of communities and open spaces where they are actually shared resources for everybody to benefit from. So there's uh, an increase in the number of communities such as uh, the Slack community, the Python software community, the Car Club Foundation, the, all the other 
uh, organizations, both local and international, which have been designed to actually uh, gather people in normally hubs and open spaces to use resources to get to know what's happening in the tech space, especially trending issues and how they can also benefit from it. One thing though that, um, that still looks like a problem to me is the sustainability of what is, is taught or what you learn after uh, meeting in these hubs and these communities. So beyond that, how do you practice on your own? So the idea is to move you from just acquiring skills to you being digitally literate. That you can know when to send what, um, know when uh, an email looks creepy, know when you are overstepping your boundaries, especially in revealing things online. So um, the, that's where the problem is to some extent, that after the trainings and the hubs and in the communities, what do you have to practice with? Which resources are available to you to use? And especially for young people who are gearing up for the future of work, we want to actually gather more skills um, to to be able to play well in the future. So currently, that's what's happening in my part of the world. And um, we are also being encouraged to take some time off to look for real problems offline and how to solve them. So when we go for these skills trainings, they, 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 they encourage us that see, in as much as you spend so much time online and trying to understand what's happening in the, in the technological space, uh, the, the, the greater percentage of what you are trying to work on or the problems you are trying to solve are found offline. So it would be in your best interest to know what it is um, in your world or what it is you want to work on and now amass the skills or get trained to do it. And the way they help us is to give us these spaces to actually meet mentors, to meet people who already know things in the space, and to ask questions. Some, a place where it is safe to ask any question and not feel like you're out of place. So basically, that's what is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Karzan. Hello, uh, I'm Karzan. I think I have some sort of a different approach because I've been more of a benefactor of informal education when it comes to digital literacy programs. I didn't have like a space where I really went to get these digital literacy trainings. Rather that I, I represent the generation of young people who are born and thriving with the internet, which means some of us come with an inept, uh, an, an adept aptitude on how to tackle things. It's very easy right now when you have access to the internet or access to a technology to really be able to utilize it. So. It's very important first that we create an accessibility or uh, an accessibility, meaningful accessibility to the internet that everybody should have it first. So we young people really want to access the internet, but this now should go hand in hand because accessibility won't do the job. We need meaningful accessibility that goes simultaneously with uh, digital literacy, which means that you have access to the resource band, you understand how to utilize it in a local context so that it can be relatable to your case. Example for us, uh, for me back home, I can go in social media and search for anything that I want rather than just the information that I do. People actually do business in social media with normal groups because they'll see somebody who looks like me and somebody who talks like me and uh, selling something that is around my region. Let it be agricultural produce or to the long supply chain. So it's very important to localize, uh, to localize those skill sets that they make sense to the ones who want to utilize. Um, another thing what I've learned is it's important when we, ta we are tackling digital skills to learn how to learn, you know? Know how you can learn. Because we, most of we young people, uh, have different approaches of how we want to learn. Like for me, I'm, I'd rather watch a video or an animation because you know, multimedia has some way of delivering knowledge uh, that is very subliminal, you can remember. So most of we young people like more creative approaches on how to learn and it's very important but we have created some sort of a very complex structure of how to deal with these things well it should be very easy because it's part of life another thing it's important to embrace spaces and dialogues when it comes to digital skills as well as the internet because we we come from places where okay the internet is uh, some sort of an abstraction that we know but we don't quite understand it and it's important that we can be free in terms of dialogue connection of ideas and exchange of aptitudes because most young people learn from each other that's the first thing you know uh, she knows something i know something we can share that's it 
as full as it goes. So this is the opportunity you can find it on the internet and things go on. So it's important to have this as safe spaces as well, where you can do the dialogue because the truth of the matter is that we have the internet, but there's a, you know, there's a downside that it's not connected or at some point you're repressed to do some, something that means you're not free to express yourself, you're not free to kind of deliver the information, so you can't learn in a proper way, per se, so you don't have the full freedom of thought on the internet. And as young people, we need to be able to have the full freedom of thought on the internet. That's how we can really learn and embrace our ideas. And uh, another thing is that we should break down the, complexity, the complexities when it comes to these digital literacy pro programs to a really general knowledge that anybody can understand, and especially viewing it in a youth lens and rhetoric. That's why I said I host a podcast where we kind of try to really break it with dialogue, you know, speaking in no more people terms from the user perspective. What is this? How can this be done? And we grow from there. And that is very important. And for now, as we approach to the fourth industrial revolution, everything that goes with it, it's important to really have accessibility to what that means. I mean, it's, we don't have that eco distribution where I come from. You can just view it as it's this, this, and that, but the resource is not available for me to physically go and, uh, you know, utilize. So it's important when we say that we want uh, the fourth industrial revolution of the 21st uh, century skills to be given to the youth, that we create some sort of an egalitarian sphere where anybody can go and actually utilize these resources that we want and to talk, to talk about. So simply that's what I think. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lillian Karzan. Um, you've put some interesting themes on the table, and I really appreciate your being here to, to really present the youth's perspective. I want to draw on a couple themes you both mentioned. You both mentioned the need for space, safe spaces for dialogue. And what strikes me is we often think of digital literacy as something that happens in a structured way, in a formal training sense. But you're talking about it, the more informal a conversation that happens beyond that. And I think that's very interesting. I'd like to hear more about that, about what that is. But also, I also hear when you say, we need safe spaces. The implication is you don't always have the safe spaces that you need, is one way you can interpret that. Um, let me know if that is correct or if that's the right understanding, and I would love to hear more. And if so, what can we do to create this, the, the environment that you feel that you need to thrive, for, for the youth to thrive? Okay. Uh, so um, what we've uh, noticed or what we've been used to from um, since long ago has been a more theoretical approach to teaching rather than a practical. So what these, not just safe, but open spaces do for us is to give or give us resources that we can actually use hands-on to add to what we've learned um, through lectures and through uh, um, camps and boot camps and all the trainings. So it's a shift from what you've been learning theoretically in classrooms and seated or formal to where you can actually um, practice and get people who have um, knowledge in other areas to help, people who have gone ahead of you to also help. The idea is um, the, these spaces you are talking about are not uh, are like where the resources are. So when I say an open space or a safe space, it's like people like me are there, they want to learn, and like Hazan said, you, they've broken down the complexities, sitting in class and being so formal. Now they can actually use even video, audio, and sometimes if you're not getting something, maybe the, the language can even be switched, and who knows, you'd understand better. So this is what it looks like, like from our part of the world. So we are moving from that theoretical-based uh, approach to more practical because there are resources available in those spaces and owing to the fact that people have, uh, have contributed to building it and have made it available to everybody to walk in and learn. So much said that uh, it doesn't have to be you gather the information and, and afterwards you can't really practice or use it for anything. I, 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 have, I was just speaking to somebody I met two years ago at lunch. I didn't know I'll meet them here, but they are here for an award um, for scaling IT in Africa, especially in Ghana. How I met them was that they came to school to scout for people who would want to undergo training, scrum training and Prince 2 training after school for four months in a place. And this is because they realized that, that, uh, that divide, what you learn and how you're able to actually uh, 
use it outside the world. So they have a training center. They take young people there. You, you, you learn for uh, four months with the resources they have there. And you get to meet people to talk to and even have projects to complete before you leave the place. So that's what these spaces are doing for us. And we, we don't have so many of those, even though there are many of them that are springing up. And this, aside the space, what's is very common is the communities. So you have, say, I mentioned early on, the Slack community, the Python community. We can have meetings online, but beyond that, some people have uh, need another form of learning, which is more physical, that they would want to uh, practice with people who are ahead. So we meet in these spaces to actually get to try things, and when there are errors, we all dialogue in, on how to solve it and learn new ways of even reaching out to solve the problems you encounter daily. So these are the kind of spaces you're talking about. And you will not find them often in universities and learning institutions, which are more formalized and sometimes um, very much packed, because you'll be talking about resources which are uh, not too um, available, and you don't have special attention if you need one because there's a lot of you and a lecture can't stop and attend to only you. So these spaces give us that extra we are looking for. Uh, yes, in the, and another approach is that uh, we have this space, safe spaces is sort of saying like there's a physical place where you can get the resources, but in an informal perspective that just social media can be a safe space if you are equally sharing information. And uh, if you come from a place where we're like young people right now, we sign online petitions uh, when something comes or you want to push an agenda, mostly that's a safe space for you to embrace and learn. Or maybe there's a digital right infringement you want to deal with. As young people, we can raise our voices. But if the social media place is not safe and I can be persecuted by just saying my voice, that's not a safe space. I am not able to learn. Because and most of these, uh, most of these spaces are motive driven rather than you know, having the social benefit of pushing for education and free dialogue. So you are unable to speak uh, fluently and uh, whatever fully and unable to ask the, the right questions so you can learn and grow. And that is very important because in any space that you go, you should be able to ask the right question like what skill do I need and how do I do this? And if you infringe maybe my digital right, how can this be? Uh, how can I really embrace this? So it's important that the safe space goes beyond this located places that are based maybe only on just doing the skills, maybe teaching to code, but where the young people are and on social media or even outside just contacting on the internet, they should be free to speak and to push for whatever they want so that they could learn. Another thing is that, uh, like for me, I'm really able to learn, you know, and I was really willing to learn. And uh, coming to embrace digital literacy, it wasn't that easy because I don't come from a major city. You have to urbanize because the resources are not there. The, there is a lack of enough safe spaces where young people can go and learn. So there is a barrier to access these resources. Even when you get to the cities where you have these limited resources, the right people do not have the same kind of mindset or ideology that can really support youth. They're not driven by the youth agenda or some say the youth dream, their youth rhetoric, who can really quite understand you, but, you know, they're really pushing for their own agendas, and they have not really created a place on the table where you can speak and say, maybe we can do it like this, or maybe I can share like this, and I think that is very important when we talk to the matter in regard to spaces. So this is, <clears throat> I think we are getting a sense of what you're asking, but I want you to be very concrete. I'm going to ask you, what is your ideal training, then, for digital literacy training? Um, I have my guesses of the answers to these questions, but there are parts that are part of school and formal education. There's parts that are outside. There is video-based training. There's in-person training. There's app-based training. There's often experimental spaces with mentors around. I'm trying to think, what is it that we're missing that's uh, not so effective, and what are the things that would be so effective? And Karzan, you also said to me before, one of your goals for this session it's not just to have a dialogue among youth, but to open up a broader dialogue between groups. And I would love to have you talk about that as well. You want to go first? Okay, so um, an ideal situation, or what we are asking basically is a blend of all, where people have very different needs and ways of learning, and hence need very different approaches in getting the message across. So you, you would realize that um, um, even though we are talking about space and, uh, spaces and all these being available, the approach is different. What if you ask students especially, how do you grab things easily? What is the way? First, a survey. And then you, you, would, shed, you would actually um, plan 
courses and models in that order so that there are different approaches for everybody to learn so that at the end of the day, you may not appeal so much to another one and another person is left handicapped. So first ask, if you can, if that's even one way to gather feedback to do something that really will be beneficial and afterwards you can get the impact you want. So get them talking. People have very different ways. Some are auditory learners, some are visual and, and all. So get, get the people to share with you and once, once you ask, it will surprise you to know that what uh, works for one person may not entirely work for another. And so you would be able to put in uh, a bit of all and have uh, impact that is far reaching rather than very, very uh, little, if you ask me. Uh, that's true. The first thing is just asking. How can you learn? How can we help? That's very true. But it's very good that we increment it because we come from a place where mostly you might not get connectivity. So. If you want to teach young people there, it should, they should really face, maybe use the educational system there to, be, to, to, to pass this, no, this knowledge. Another thing is use of a different approach, maybe if you can teach them with open data available on social media or easy space where somebody can just go and get this information, that will be really, really nice. And uh, multimedia content as well. Uh, if we can really embrace social media, because social media is a place for learning a lot. We see we learn with courses in YouTube. Not necessarily, it's not, not many of us can really interact with open course softwares there on the internet. It's very difficult. You need somebody to guide you through the process. So if we could really start at incrementing this from the people, from the educators, the legislators, and down you know, to the level where you can find the actual youth uh, trying to present their agenda. Fantastic. So I would like to bring in our other two speakers first. I'll start with Sharda on the remote, who will like if we can connect in our remote participant. Sharda Srinivasan uh, is going to share with us some of the research that One World Connected has gathered on digital literacy training about uh, overall trends and uh, what the gaps and policy implications are. Sharda. Am I audible? Hello? We hear you. Okay, great. Um, great, I just wanted to confirm. Um, okay, it's a pleasure to be a participant uh, in this session. Um, I wanted to spend some time uh, doing three things in my remarks. The first thing that I wanted to do um, is really to, to ground the importance of digital skills for youth give you some context around why it's really important. Um, in the areas of the world where internet is growing the most, um, Africa and South Asia, 60% of Africa is youth right now. 1.5 million people enter the labor market in South Asia. The challenge for digitally skilling our youth is one that's incredibly germane to policy making and policy decisions, not just from the perspective of technology adoption, but in terms of the jobs that we need to create and the way we need to see the, see the path forward for a lot of countries in this region, in these regions where we have done a lot of research in as well. So what is it that we have found so far? Um, at One World Connected, we did a, a global case study research project that has spanned for three years. Um, and we collected data on different innovative approaches to connect underserved communities. Very quickly, out of 1,000 odd projects, we had about 643 that in some way, shape, or form touched digital skills training. We have in our case studies that we developed through in-depth interviews out of 120, over 37 of them have to do with digital skills and 25 are focused on youth. It's really important to understand what the trends are and that's what I wanna focus on in terms of remarks. I then will look at some of the gaps and things we do not know and what we really can do to learn more about this and implications for policymakers. What we do know about digital skills training programs from the research that we've conducted across case studies is often that they vary very widely in terms of the goals that they are trying to achieve and the audiences that they serve. What do I mean? We have a few that serve in school, after school coding club type participation. And we have a lot that's like focused on out of school training, focused towards different audiences, out of, uh, out of jobs, youth, 
high school dropouts. Amongst the youth, we have br broader demographics, people who are working within in like within a specific home-based uh, like learning system and do not have access to technology really at school. So we have that uh, dimension. That is that there is a variation in the audiences and the goals that these programs have. We also see that predominantly a lot of these are run by civil society and public interest organizations. We have a few, but a very few of our 25 that are really integrated into school curricula. Even when we have after schools clubs, which is like the Ghana Code Club, we have the Give One Project in Gambia. While they cooperate and coordinate with schools, they're often led by independent organizations that then go into schools and use those anchor institutions as places where they can conduct digital skills training. What that also shows, and this is potentially a gap, is that education systems right now still have a very archaic way of thinking through like ICT skills and ICT training that has not adapted to the things that Karsan and Lily mentioned in the first half of the session. Oftentimes, what we learned when we did fieldwork in Rwanda in rural and remote schools, teachers were very comfortable teaching from the book and were very comfortable teaching computer skills, not necessarily digital skills, not necessarily things that enable people to learn the, the kinds of, and learn and create the kinds of communities that have been mentioned, Python communities, Slack communities, using online social media or YouTube courses. Part of, his, part of it is because they don't have the infrastructure. You don't have enough electricity. You don't have enough like, like basic laptops and tablets to be able to do this. But part of it is also just capacity. And that's a gap that we really need to think about more systematically. Something that's not really happening at this stage from our case studies within the countries that a lot of our projects operate in. The second thing that we learned is that there is a wide variation in curriculum and pedagogy. And I take the point that Lily just made, where she said it's really important to do, like understand the needs of the users of these technologies and personalized learning is really important. Research shows that computer-assisted learning is most effective when it is done in a personalized way, trained to the teaching level of the student. There is research from a randomized controls trial in India that came out in 2016 that shows that computer-assisted learning can really cause a huge impact in terms of learning outcomes within uh, uh, like scores in mathematics and scores in Hindi, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but it's not really focused on digital ICT skills per se. Um, and I think that that's an important dimension to consider. However, what we did find in the 25 case studies that we studied is that there was no coherent set of definitions on what qualified as digital skills. Some organizations were teaching basic, how do you operate and use a mobile phone kind of stuff. There were others who said, we will teach you basic coding, logo, sometimes even more, uh, how to build a website, a WordPress website, et cetera. There were others that said, no, we want to teach you JavaScript, Python, advanced technical skills. And yet others said that this is about skilling you for the technology, for IT certifications, for being able to do it at telecenters and be able to work as in the information technology industry. Those are all very different skills and are very different in the way they are taught and like require a different baseline in terms of your comfort with technology and comfort with coding. A gap that needs to be filled is really understanding this taxonomy and different international organizations are doing this, but oftentimes the process has been more top down and not very participatory. So something that came up in the session, and I'm very glad that we are doing it with the youth coalition, is often that we need to have this kind of understanding of different kinds of digital skills, but oftentimes it needs to be a participatory process to help us define these skills. But that's a gap we see right now. The last thing that I wanna talk about is in terms of duration and the way it is taught. There is wide variation in what we see in terms of the way delivery is occurring. What do I mean by that? Some people have a module that you have to complete before doing an after-school class, which you are then tested on. It goes from anywhere between one month to three months in time. Other projects in our, in our case studies have decided that they want to do three months of in-person after-school 
training on specific sets of skills, while others do it in the form of workshops periodically and do it from school to school because they are lacking capacity. Most of these are not really thought through in terms of what, what creates the most impact within these communities. And we don't have good evidence right now, and this is a gap, to understand what it is that we need in order to be able to measure this impact and create the most impact for these communities. Needs assessment is one part of that, like that, that uh, answering that question. But the other part I think that's really important is doing systematic studies, like studies that measure different groups uh, uptake in terms of digital skills through different programmatic designs. Ways that we can do this, and this is being done in education more broadly through randomized control trials, difference in different uh, methodologies, etc., are not really being done for like digital skills programs. Part of it is because like a lot of these are ad hoc grant funded programs that run their course and disappear. But part of it is really there hasn't been much thought on what the learning outcome is. Is it that you have gotten into the job market? Is it that you have like learned how to use a mobile phone to interact very much with the community and learn informally better? What is it that a digitally skilled person uh, is, is capable of needs more thinking in terms of impact, but also we need to be able to see how do we measure this? We need to see what ages take up what kinds of skills in the best possible way, doing it by creating treatment and control groups that are like, like based on class size, based on gender of the teacher, based on the age group that is being targeted, based on the curriculum changes, based on whether, for instance, you want to do modules and then like do an after school class or based on um, other criteria of pedagogy might be really, really helpful. And the policy implication for this is that we really need to think about this a little bit more systematically. It might be that each country has a different like way in which digital skills are best uh, assimilated in their population because of the kinds of baselines that they have. However, right now we do not have this uh, in terms of a, a systematic understanding within any particular country. One thing that we do know, however, from a recent evaluation of the Digital Ambassadors Program, which does use local liaison, is that you do have more take up in terms of digital skills, especially amongst the, the communities that they were in, which shows in some ways that local liaisons can be useful in certain contexts. We also saw this as an emerging lesson from some of our case studies, which says that if we have local trainers, we can have some kind of sustainability going forward. However, we don't know if this generalizes. We don't know if the fact that digital ambassadors was very successful in Rwanda means that the same model can replicate in other countries. And that kind of study is needed in terms of, and that kind of study is both needed in terms of research and in terms of thinking through policy. Lastly, an implication for policy is that while it's really important to think through these topics, integrating them systematically into curriculum design and allowing for ev evolution of curricula with the evolution of skills, because right now Python is really, really cool. 10 years ago, it was not, is really important. And the way curriculum reform happens in most countries that we have digital skills programs in is often a very slow moving process. So in Rwanda in schools, they were still being taught at the ICT level. In schools, they were still being taught Microsoft Word and basic applications, not necessarily very advanced skills where we saw them. It's really important to keep up with technology and keep up with skills that are needed to use the most advanced technologies. And a policy implication is really to think through how we think about curriculum reform in light of the facts that we know about this. That is all. I'd like to bring you into the conversation now uh, from your perspective from Kenya and your experience with the projects you've worked in, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in my perspectives on uh, policy and what has been happening in uh, Kenya in particularly. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, governments in Africa uh, and Kenya have made great strides in, uh, in uh, trying to instill digital skills for the youth and also recognizing that uh, it has to start from early levels of learning. So government of Kenya specifically has um, is trying to come up with uh, 
competence-based curriculum where all the subjects they're trying to um, integrate ICT in the use uh, or even in training for the teachers. But this has come with uh, uh, serious challenges as well because uh, it, it was a political, um, uh, uh, somehow uh, skewed towards political, a uh, political project because it came as a, as a manifesto uh, when the president was uh, running for presidency in the last elections. And uh, this meant that uh, with the nature of our elections, that then um, there would be um, like less policy support or half of it because uh, our elections again uh, usually uh, divisive um, for our country. And this brings in a governance aspect when it comes to making policies for the youth. Um, that aside, we also realized that uh, there are very many um, problems when it came to uh, digital skilling for youth and especially for the lower levels of uh, learners. So. Uh, for the country to have uh, made uh, or uh, come up with a curriculum that uh, um, gave out these skills uh, with the use of computer and uh, any other digital learning, it would mean that it would have to serve the whole population from the rural area to the urban areas. So the challenges were uh, there are no electricity, uh, there are no devices, and even when the government tried to bring in devices uh, with a policy of one laptop per child uh, for lower primary school, then we would face problems of uh, security again because uh, laptops are scarce there and uh, it would need the schools to, to, to be well infrastructured uh, in terms of security, in terms of power, uh, areas where there would be flooding, then uh, they would try to mitigate them in terms, uh, by constructing dams. So it's a very, um, it would really require a lot of investments for the, from the government and then, and that's why it started from scratch. Uh, it doesn't mean that the digital literacy program stalled, but it's because the other underlying issues had to be taken care of before, before that. So at, um, at adult level, and that's from um, secondary school level going up when the youth finish uh, secondary schooling, there are other programs uh, that they can take to to, um, for digital literacy. But again, these are not vetted by the government, uh, and you'll find uh, what the speakers just talked about, that adults are taught um, on uh, basic digital skills that you can acquire even without attending a class or having to invest your money uh, on such courses. Examples are Words, Excel, and all that to 19-year-olds. I think um, a, a good policy would uh, actually um, start with uh, regulating what kind of content that these colleges are offering. So apart from that, we, we see very good progress in terms of access, and uh, that means that the youth are able to use practical skills uh, uh, that are being offered online uh, by the online MOOCs. Uh, good examples are the EDX that offer programming uh, courses for the youth. And uh, most of them, it means that most of them go into the job market not having certificates, but having the real skills to work. But this again is a downside uh, the, uh, to governance. Uh, because again, the government is trying to say that um, we they need to they need to to kind of bring up bodies that would uh, shape uh, these skills and uh, these professional bodies. But when it comes to ICT, people don't have to go to school to acquire uh, these skills. So that would mean if you come up with a body that regulates ICT professionals, for example, it would be to lock these individuals outside these uh, job opportunities because they are self-taught people and they don't have certificates to prove that they, 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 they are competent enough. They need uh, actual practical tests so that they, they can take that while, uh, while uh, applying for jobs. So that, uh, that's an example of a bad policy that uh, is really not ne uh, we really need to look out for when you're advocating for youth taking up jobs. Another one is on um, governance and innovation. Um, we need an environment where 
a normal youth from the rural area can educate themselves on ICT policy, innovate, and actually that innovation goes from uh, be, becomes relevant from down and becomes something big like M-Pesa without anybody's influence like a big brother's. So that means that the level of play should be, should be fair for the youth to be able to innovate. So without that, we'll be creating um, people who are consuming digital technology vis-a-vis uh, -vis innovators or creators of technology. So that's another uh, policy challenge that we have. Others are on access. And uh, when we come with uh, access to broadband, then we need to um, activate these other policies around broadband that make people use uh, the internet and technologies. Yeah, I I'd like to stop there, but um, um, on broadband still before I stop, I think the other policies that are important to activate the broadband access, like access to information, cybersecurity policies, uh, and any other policies that are relevant uh, to push broadband up. Other, others would be affordability, and not just affordability for mobile broadband, because uh, mob most Africans access the internet through the mobile, but that only makes them um, consumers of content, but we don't have uh, um, access that uh, that makes people access a broadband in their houses or a bri uh, large speeds, big speeds of broadband, and that uh, that kind of poses a limit towards which people can use digital technologies. Well, thank you very much, Liz. I want to draw you out a little bit on a couple points you made. It seems that Kenya has instituted a national curriculum. I find some tensions between that and the things that Karzan is saying and Lily is saying about the need to customize. I also am a former, I'm an educator now, and my first job was a high school teacher out of college. You can't be infinitely flexible for every student, and there seems to be a tough balance. There's something else you said. You said there's a difference between urban and rural. And with the uniform national curriculum, how do you make it work for the very different populations you will have in the urban areas and the rural areas? Actually, that's very true. Uh, let me start with the uniformity of uh, the challenges uh, or the opportunities that these different students uh, face. Uh, the thing with the competence-based curriculum uh, that the government is trying to roll out is because we, we realize that uh, our education system uh, does not make the youth come out as innovators because it's more of theory work and it needed uh, more practical work uh, to, to be integrated with the, uh, with the, with the education system. So this competent-based uh, uh, curriculum comes with more practical uh, stuff in it whereby uh, the learners are not being given homework in terms of uh, written work, but uh, things to do with creating, uh, creating things with the, within the interests that they have. So the downside of it is that... Um, the, the infrastructure is not there even at home, and uh, even the, the culture, you'll find that uh, the girl child maybe after school they're supposed to fetch water for, for work, and it needs so much uh, investment in time for, for the child to, to create whatever you want them to create and come and showcase in class. Uh, that is one. Number two is the skills again, because at home who would help them? Uh, in their homework if it's technical, because uh, uh, again, in the rural areas, their parents are not digitally skilled. So that is not uniformed. And then I mentioned about um, these differences again. Uh, the reason why the digital literacy program for the, for the government didn't take off is because of these uniformities, because uh, in rural areas you don't have electricity. Um, giving a child a laptop would be like a threat or uh, in, like giving them insecurity because you can't walk the streets with a, an expensive mobile phone in rural areas. You're, it's like you're, you're attracting muggers. And, uh, and again, uh, that would be for, for, for the small child, you'd be experiencing incidences of kidnaps and all, the, all those sorts of mis mischiefs. 
So there are very many problems around it. Even schools have been broken into just to, uh, because the thieves wanted to steal the, the, the infrastructure. So that meant that the government uh, was to invest in uh, network access, security for schools, and all that. But, that, but again, the, another downside of this is that even the infrastructure that would be in schools would not be used. They would just be locked in schools because they are also, again, preventing these kinds of damages to this infrastructure. So when the government is doing audit on how this infrastructure is being used, they find out that they've never even been opened because the person or the teacher who was in charge of the equipment was given a strong warning that if these computers are damaged or stolen in any other way, then it's you who's going to pay for them in, with your salaries. So uh, that's another policy direction that uh, would make these efforts um, like the policy implementation challenging. Thank you very much. So I'd like to bring Karzan, Lily, and Kar Lily back into this. I'd be interested to hear your reactions to these discussions about policies. And I'm really struck by something that Liz said, which is I'd love to hear your perspective on how to make it not just competence, but how do we create innovators? How do we create those sorts of creative problem solvers? What kind of programs do you think we should be creating and what's the problem with the programs that we have now that's causing this not to accomplish everything we want to accomplish? Um, I mentioned something that, uh, I mentioned something early on about how um, there is a new approach to actually um, digitally scaling people, where you spend time uh, looking for real life situations and uh, trying to innovate around them. You know, I've had, I've, I've had uh, developers walk to me and say, I've built this awesome application and it can do this and this. And I'm, I'm asking myself, okay, so who, who did you run the idea by? Is it actually a problem? The person goes through from um, ideation to execution and the, the product or the solution has to be shelved for later use. So in as much as we want to digitally scale people, we have to spend time getting people to even know how to find problems. And that's actually, I think, the first step to being an innovator. There should be a right problem identification approach. What is it you've seen? What are you building? What are you going to um, build to solve it? That's design thinking and more. And you even want to bring the human perspective in it. Someone said that you're building human-centered or yeah, human-centered applications that actually solve problems and actually uh, are really, you can measure the impact. That's how innovation is supposed to go. And we may want to also look at, um, to a large extent, I think this is, it, sh it shouldn't be more governmental or country-based. I think it, it should cut across. It should be um, cross-sector. Someone said that you can have international bodies even complementing where governments are not able to reach. In that, um, in that aspect, you can have, that's why we have people, um, like Liz mentioned, there is one policy government is ruling out, and you're saying that because we have differences between rural and urban areas, it, can be, it wouldn't be so friendly because of the differences and how unique each person is in learning. So while the, while the government is doing things that are more uh, broad, in general, we can have these international bodies who are empowered to even do something that's broken down so people can actually benefit from. And that's, where, that's why there's an increase in communities and spaces in Ghana. Because some, some are saying, okay, join this because you're going to find this. Join this because you're going to do this. That's because you're not finding these exact things in the schools. So um, my go-to plan would be that, that, that we are doing the trainings and all. There should be some other time spent off, offline trying to actually build the faculties, the thinking, the pro um, problem identification, and all other things that come with it, even the soft skills, if you ask me. Um, first of all, uh, at a policy level, I think that, like from a Tanzanian perspective, is that we have policy that is not innovation friendly, that is not inclusive, and we kind of have a plurality in understanding between the actual innovators and the ones who want to politicize the innovation. And we haven't actually opened up or embraced uh, flexible education models, uh, which are really competency-based and can really be progressive and adapt to the 
changing times and that that is very important another thing is that uh, we are really forced to modernize. Like you need to go to a certain city in the rural perspective. You need to go to a certain city so you can access some kind of resource that can enable you to be digital savvy. So I think uh, we should rather spread it to the villages just to have this some sort of a basic level of uh, infrastructure that anybody can go to. and. Uh, also migrate the skills, not only from the cities, but spread it to these rural areas where people can actually really share this perspective and uh, have open models on how it can be disseminated. And uh, another thing is how we should uh, measure the impact. It should not only be based on numbers, that uh, we have maybe brought computers to rural villages, this, this, is this. No, we should measure impact and how it really affects the person or the user you know, the use of these technologies, you know, and how it can cascade in a different mode rather than just uh, we brought to 200 children who switched on the computer and used Microsoft Word. No, it shouldn't be like that. We should find a different way of how we could measure this impact long term by having access to these technologies, but how they really actually kind of like interact to, to, to together to bring that change that they need. I think that can really localize and it can be relevant. Well, thank you very much. Um, at this point, I would, uh, we have about nine minutes left. I would love to open the floor to any questions that you may have. I will collect all the questions first and then allow the panel to respond to them as a group. I see one question here and one question here, please. Uh, and identify yourself if you would. Yes, my name is Nicolas Fiumarelli. I am from Uruguay and UDICF ambassador this year. It's not a question, it's just uh, my experience from my local perspective. Uh, this idea of inclusiveness and equal conditions to achieve great changes is what we have to continue proliferating. It's about replicating, I think, about the mentorship experience, online courses, about learning ICT, programming. I seen always about this word, replication, around the world. The student becomes the mentor of others and also the teacher of his family. In my country, Uruguay, is a tiny country in South America. The population of youth is not more than for 100,000 people. There are 135,000 children and adolescents under the, under the poverty line. And uh, 90,000 90, of them <coughs> live in rural areas. The, there is a, a program that is the Sable program that is a socio-educational project of Uruguay created by decree in 2007, a few years ago in order to carry out studies, evaluations, and actions necessary to provide one computer to each school-aged child and each public school teacher, as well as to train teachers in the use of the, of the tool and promote the elaboration of educational proposals in accordance with them. So it's based uh, on the one laptop per child program, but become, became different with, within the time. Uh, this, this program seeks to promote digital inclusion in order to reduce the digital divide both with respect to other countries and among the citizens. But the mere inclusion of technology in schools does not ensure the, the fulfillment on, on the goal if, it's, if it is not accompanied by an educational proposal according to the new requirements, as, as a lot of you said, uh, but both for teachers and for students and their families, right? Thus, this plan uh, has a very complete system that you could uh, take a look on the website, that seeks to guarantee the use of technological resources, teacher training, and the development of appropriate content in addition to the family and social participation also. So the strategy principles containing these projects are equity, equal opportunities for all children and, and all young people, democratization of knowledge, also the availability of tools to learn, and better learning not only in regard to the education I provided in the school, but also in learning for yourself to use modern technology. I think this is a good example, and more than 10 years from the beginning of this program, it evolved a lot, and nowadays kids are learning programming skills. So I think it's very good for the future. I want to highlight about displacement of work, that is something that is happening globally, and it's a reality that is happening, and in general, we as young people want a more uh, optimal world in terms of including technology in our lives. So we want equal conditions for all uh, and to be able to evolve as a society. Thank you very much. Please. 
Uh, my name is Manuel Kampitakis. Um, I'm here in my capacity as a member of the uh, Karls Computer Club in Karlsruhe. Uh, we are uh, active in educating the youth, um, mostly on a, on, it's a remark, sorry. I had to take that uh, first. Uh, we, we are active as uh, volunteers, uh, educating children in our spare time. Uh, we have multiple projects running around Germany because also in Germany um, the education system and the school system and the curriculum is moving too slow to keep up with technology and also we think and we believe that um, the inherent interest in technology is not instilled in the youth. Um, what uh, we do is called Chaos Machschule. On the one part, we go to schools and uh, fill the curricula. That's, that's the part that was mentioned before. Uh, external organizations going to schools and educating the, the children. Then we do multiple events outside of that. And in, in all this, we gathered the experience, and I personally did so too, that children... Um, they only need a spark to get interest in technology, and we're not talking about uh, Python skills, we're not talking about word skills, we're not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about an inherent interest in technology, an inherent uh, thirst for, uh, for knowledge. And as soon as you spark that, uh, the children actually develop a knowledge and a capacity to teach themselves out of pure curiosity. curiosity. Uh, obviously, access to the internet is a given. We, we have to, that, that, is, that has to exist if there is no mentor there because the internet has the resources to, to, uh, to educate and uh, to, to provide information to whoever seeks it, especially on those topics. That's how most of the, of the people that are active in the CCC uh, did that. And, in, and last but not least, remove the respect that is instilled in us by technology, remove that and just treat technology as something else you can play with. And don't be afraid to take things apart and put them back together as they were not intended, because in the end, that is what innovation means. And if we want to teach the youth, we want to teach them also to, uh, to bring us further than we are now. Thank you very much. Last question. Hi, I'm Marco Harder. I'm in my personal capacity. I'm from the private se sector, and I uh, work in the learning and development space, and I've been doing so in the last 15 years. So I'd like to bring a perspective of someone who has had to deal with the consequences of not having a solid framework policy and infrastructure for digitally skilling. Um, some of the, the points mentioned earlier by Lillian Carson resonated very well with me, and I'd like to enumerate them one by one, hopefully in a very terse way. First off, Lily mentioned that there needs to be a a strong uh, move from not just acquiring the skills, but creating a, a system in which these skills are demonstrated. In these, and, and I think that's how you mean digital literacy, the ability to actually demonstrate that skills. In our practice, one of the things that we have found to be very effective, not just in the technical skills when we talk about future skills, is to, to, uh, to my compatriot's point, allowing, thing, allowing people to make mistakes and let them learn from them. And we've taken seriously the adage that experience is the best teacher because it gives the test first before it gives the lesson. And that's how we structure our learning activities around that. Um, secondly, one of the interesting things that I point that I heard from this discussion is how do you create innovators? And this is where I, I am really passionate about in the last uh, two years, because uh, in the firm that I work for, for the past two years, there's been a drive to educate our people who work in the, the business process outsourcing industry, which employs about a million and 200 people in the Philippines, to, to get them conversant in artificial intelligence and the other technologies that are poised to disrupt uh, our industry. And we've done that, and at least in our firm, we've done that for 90%, about 27,000 of our workforce. But as a, as a steward of learning and talent development in my firm, one of the things that I'm discovering is that you won't get very far with technical skills alone. So what we've looked at is you need to have a good base of technical skills, but you should not forget, if you're, not, if you're serious about creating innovators and disruptors, you need to have what we call timeless skills leadership skills, the ability to co collaborate. To your point about asking the right people for the right technology, those skills, we're not born with those skills, is our position. And now our thrust is to make sure that these two skill areas are addressed. 
because uh, to our point, technology will change. It's just a tool, but these timeless skills need to be there when the technology changes so that uh, we have a workforce that can uh, be productive for years on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We only have a very short time left, but I will let the panelists give uh, closing thoughts and any reactions to uh, the comments people have made. Yeah, um, I think all of them actually um, added to it, and it's, 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 it's almost the same everywhere, especially with digital skills, and adding on to be actually very digital, um, digitally literate, and to be able to do something. Ultimate, ultimately, all these are gearing towards um, for in my part of the world, economic empowerment, if you ask me. Especially young people who leave schools and are looking for jobs and are finding and enter these accelerator programs, enter these uh, spaces to learn something for themselves. So once you're able to fully train their faculties, the, the, the pressure on, uh, on of public offices, all the other places where people uh, are chasing, get lessened and people are able to do something for themselves. And I think the future is exciting. Uh, I think the first thing we should do is that we should build a curiosity-driven culture that embr embraces experimentation. Uh, if you want to break that form to understand it, do that. We shouldn't create this complex barrier when it comes to innovation or understanding things. That's the important thing. And that is my closing remark. For me, how do you um, create skills for innovation rather than just consumption would be the major thing would be access. Uh, and that would mean access to uh, devices, access to networks. Uh, because when people don't have access, they don't have the opportunity to experiment with technology. And uh, you'll find that they, they are only exposed when uh, they can afford it. And uh, that is at a later, at a later age, when, they are not, uh, when their careers are not uh, skewed towards technology or they are not using technology for whatever they are doing. And so with the access, it means that uh, the, the governments need to um, actually create time or invest time and money for meaningful access and not just uh, also just just access for the sake of access, but uh, quality access speeds and, uh, and uh, the devices uh, that people are using, uh, rather than mobile, other devices that can actually uh, help them create content, be it local content, uh, be it other uh, technologies that uh, are relevant for the community. That's it for me. Thank you. Sharda, any closing thoughts? Uh, Sharda, we can't hear you. You'll have to start from the beginning. Can I, can I, am I heard? Yes. Hello? Yes, you can, st we can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, so my, my closing remark is that we have two online uh, participants who have wanted to make an intervention so I will give my floor to them but also wanted to say that the challenge around how we create innovators is not solely a developing or a dev having access problems <laughs> um, if there is a problem with her, if, there, if the online participants have a short intervention, we can open it to them. We lost you, Sharda. So were there online participants who wanted Hello? to make interventions? Yes. Hello? Yes. If you can give a brief intervention, we are Hello? over time. Yes. You are welcome to, we would welcome your participation. Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes. I, my, I just have a question concerning the, the funding and the, uh, is it possible that there is local integration in terms to do with the funding that, uh, uh, the funding that should be used to uh, train and mentor people in order for them to acquire skills? Uh, is there an organization that uh, is mobilizing for funds at local level? Thank you, Christopher. Is there another in online intervention?
I believe you are on mute. If you are talking, we cannot hear you. You need to turn Please yourself off. That, uh, uh, we can hear you now. Well, we are five minutes over time. Um, uh, yes, my name is Joseph. Please go ahead, Joseph. Yeah. Yes, my name is Joseph. We are hosting a remote hub here in Kampala, and uh, one of our participants asks uh, whether the actually it's says more of a suggestion that there be joint efforts in addressing the challenge rather than uh, having it to, uh, attached to governments uh, coming up with different policies if as the internet space yeah, yes so one of the participants is suggesting we can we, sh we should have a uh, joint efforts as an internet space not as a uh, government or individuals or just emerging institutions rather we can make more efforts or we can have greater impact if we come as internet space uh we are running a trident of youth engagement different initiatives are coming up to do digital literacy and skilling of youths so it would be much important um, of great impact if as the internet space come together to do it, then attributing it to government and uh, different institutions. That is our suggestion from the hub in Kapala. Thank you very much. I will ask Liz, you're probably the best person to talk, talk about, about funding. Fun yeah, I agree with the speaker. Uh, the reason why I am insisting with the government is because uh, the government is this institution that we've given power and we pay tax to, to solve our problems. So uh, if anything goes wrong with the, with the society, then we'd pay, point fingers to the government. But yes, it's true. Um, every stakeholder should uh, take this up uh, within their levels of interest and uh, try to contribute to, uh, to this challenge of digital literacy as much as they can. Perhaps uh, what you should do is to do a mapping on uh, the capacity of different st stakeholders and what they can do, and then uh, maybe the government to take up the rest where the stakeholders can't. Well, this has been very informative. I mean, I, I'm actually in a conversation with people of having different modules and resources and giving more flexibility to try to support it on a more of a joint way in the ways you're discussing because, uh, as we know, education is often very local and, as you said, it's very personal. And so there's finding that blend of interventions which can draw on the leverage of different experiences but customized to individual needs is one of the great challenges of this space. Uh, I apologize for keeping us over uh, a little bit, but I appreciate all of you staying here and uh, sharing the commitment. The reason you're still here in the room is this is such an important issue. Uh, please join me in thanking all the panelists and all the participants for such a terrific discussion. Schedule for an hour.
session. Um, there is an organization that Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, being last. Haben die hier Sprecher aus dem Internet? Nee, okay. Okay. Und jetzt haben wir hier aber neun Leute, die hier zuhören in dem Raum? Ja. Okay. Na, drei davon sind die drei Laptops. Sind unsere drei Laptops. Aha, also okay. einer davon ist der hier, ein der andere der und der andere der immer. Okay. Also sind nur sechs. Gerade. Habe ich nur auf die. <lacht> Ob die uns jetzt hören können? Nee, das ist nicht Wo sollen siehst du das? An Achso. dem Ding hier, weil das hat. Also, das soll ja so sein, dass das Mikro hier nicht funktioniert. Das soll ja nicht das Mikro funktionieren. Ja, ja, genau. Also, hier funktioniert es nicht. Das, ja, soll ja auch nicht. Ja. Okay. Das ist sehr komisch. Ich 
Mal beim Listen. Also was wir jetzt mal machen können, ist, dass du einfach den Raum, belassen Raum 3, einfach mal gemutet. Weil der war jetzt vorher hast du ihn ja immer angemacht eigentlich, mhm. oder? Und dann gemutet, wenn jemand anders gesprochen hat. Das Ding ist, der ist die ganze Zeit an. 
damit die ähm, Online-Participants es hören. Das hören, ne? Weil wenn der aus ist, hören die nichts. Hören sie nichts. Deswegen fragt sie auch immer, can you hear me? Ah, ja, ja, ja. Und dann ist halt nichts, weil ich ihn ausmache. Ja, ja, okay. Weil wenn, also wenn der aus ist, hören die, die Online-Leute nichts. Also ich check das System auch nicht. Das Problem ist, also was ich krieg, ist die Summe aus diesem Chat. Also wenn du jetzt die Mikrofone anmachst, das hören wir dann hier. Ist ja auch klar, ne? Wir wollen einen Typen aus Uganda hören. Wenn du aber dann noch den Raum 3 anmachst, dann hören wir den auch hier und dann ist es eine Schleife, weil dann hören wir das über, wir hören das über dieses, die Software, kommt es wieder zurück und dann geht es wieder rein und kommt wieder zurück, geht wieder rein, kommt wieder zurück und dann kommt so ein, so ein mhm. das ist halt das, was wir nicht wollen. Ich habe man vorhin mal kurz gehört, das macht so ein, dann wird es immer. Und ja, was die halt hier machen müssten, ist, die müssten irgendwie ja. diese, diesen Raum 3 nicht als, als Participant, ja. also nicht als Mitteiler, sondern irgendwie anders einschleifen, sodass wir den nicht wieder zurückkriegen. Aber das kriegen sie halt nicht hin. Hm. Weißt du? Also, und man könnte, ja, ja, keine Ahnung. Also, das... Das, ist echt das Ding ist, ich mache ja den Raum erst wieder an, wenn die Person fertig ist. Genau, dann machst du den Raum an und ich mach's dann aus, da, damit der Raum nicht hier ist. Weil sonst haben wir den Raum hier doppelt und dann kommt diese Feldschleife. Das ist immer das. Also du machst ihn an, den Raum, und ich mache ihn aus. Hier aus. So ist also. Ich zeig das so richtig Ja, ja, es ist nicht so, es ist nicht so einfach. Es ähm. ist nicht so einfach zu verstehen. Aber deswegen ist es doch gut, dass du hier bist. Also, also habe ich doch noch. Ja, Moment aber doch. das kann ich ja nicht gleich. Sonst müsste ich immer gleichzeitig hier klicken und da. Das macht schon Sinn, dass du da bist. Das aber zum Beispiel, dass, dass der Rechner nicht auch da drüben ist. Keine Ahnung. Das check ich auch nicht irgendwie. Okay. Ich mute jetzt mal hier alle. Laura, wer sind denn, die kommen an, kommen schon manchmal kommen hier so Leute, so, die sagen, dass sie die, die Internetmoderatoren sind oder sowas? Online-Moderatoren. Online-Moderatoren? Ja, die gucken dann so ein bisschen mehr auf Zoom, wenn wir Aber fragen. Also gerade eben, die Frau hat sich halt, es war hier gerade echt voll der Gesprächsbedarf, sag ich mal, aus dem Internet. <lacht> ja. Und die Frau hat halt einfach nichts gemacht. Nichts gesagt, also, nur man nehmen, wenn die da so fragen. Wenn ich ja, ich kann gerne das Mikrofon noch fragen, dass alle das fragen. Wenn sie mich angucken, auch so, nee, die machen nichts. Das für Leute? Ja, dann ist er die Aufgabe von diesem Online-Moderator, ihm das die Fragen stellen. Ja. ja, und nicht von, äh, nicht von uns. Nee, wir sind ja nur der tätige Arzt. Ja, eben. Also, das hat die deswegen gibt es die ja auch, weil ja. sonst hätten die ja keinen Sinn. Also, also bei Essen könnt ihr auch. Das ist ja auch echt, glaube ich. Ja, ich glaube, bei dir einfach keine Einführung. Also, die wissen selber gar nicht, was sie machen wollen. Nee, ich kriege mir die WhatsApp-Nachrichten, wo sie irgendwie von welchen Menschen anhalten hat sie auch nicht vorgelesen. Wenn ich so ja, und dann guck, du, 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 da ist eine Frage, ich so ja, dann zeig ihr das und dann guckt sie drauf und dann hat sie es wieder nicht. Ja, ich meine, da ist auch ein Mikrofon, ne? die kann doch einfach nicht. Ja. Manche Menschen sind nicht Und? Scheiße. Alles scheiße, oder? Dein Scheiß gehst du nach Hause jetzt. Geh jetzt nach Hause.
Okay, uh, testing the mic. One, two, three. Okay, can we have everyone come to the top table, please? We'll be starting shortly.
ask you a quick question? Yes. Of so we're planning on showing. Oh, sorry. 